We are on the edge of an idea so revolutionary, it will almost certainly change the direction of the future of humanity for the better. And those are big words, but I'm going to try to pack them up here. But first, I have a question for you all. What do ant colonies and the internet both have in common? Well, they're both examples of what are called decentralized systems, where simple rules play, but complex behavior emerges out of it with no central planning. The study of this area is called systems theory, and it's important to understand the very basics for the, for the concept of this big idea I'll get to in a moment. So if I can have 60 seconds of your time, we're all going to have a crash course on systems theory right now. Ready? So systems are simply entities and the relationships made up between those entities. There are things called feedback loops, which is actually when the output flows back into the input of a system. And these are usually happen in a couple different ways. One of them is what's called a reinforcing feedback loop, uh, where something will grow exponentially. Uh, a common ex ex like situation or example would be something like a compound interest in your bank account. That's a system with a reinforcing feedback loop. Another type of feedback loop is called a balancing one, where it'll actually try to aim towards an equilibrium or a stable situation, regardless of inputs. Sometimes there are delays in these feedback loops, and these can cause problems, specifically what are called oscillations. Now, oscillations will spin out of control and often destroy a system. In fact, we'll see this um, a lot within the financial industry and whatnot. But what happens is that the actual system is trying to overcompensate for that oscillation happening, and it spirals out of control. So we can see that there's kind of balances and checks that happen within systems that apply to all different things in our life. There are, in more complex systems, the concept of hierarchy. And hierarchy isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it can actually um, be used in a bad way. Um, hierarchy should always exist for the sake of the parts within it. Never does hierarchy exist for the sake of control or for that central authority. Many systems with deep hierarchy often believe that the parts exist to serve that central authority, when in fact, the opposite is true. So balance and self-organization and resilience are some of the reasons why these decentralized systems are so powerful. So there, <laughs> there's your 60-second crash course in the basics of systems theory. You all are now experts. Congratulations. So what is an example of one of these decentralized systems that we might find in nature? Well, one of them are ant colonies that we mentioned earlier. See, ants are fascinating. They create these things called foraging trails, which are small, tiny highways across the land where ants shuffling back and forth trying to bring food back to the colony. What's interesting is that when an ant finds a piece of food, as it's coming back to the ant colony, it will leave a chemical called a pheromone. Now, since all ants are attracted to this pheromone chemical, ants leaving the colony to go find the food pick up on the scent and follow that same track down. And when they find the food, they'll leave their own pheromone trail back. This is an example of a reinforcing feedback loop. The more ants that find that trail, the more pheromones laid down, the more attraction that brings more ants on there, and the system builds. What's really fascinating about this is this kind of behavior allows colonies to actually solve very challenging problems together, like finding the shortest path between the colony and food. Now, no one ant decided what the right way to go was, but they all together, through the beauty of systems theory, emerged with the right, most optimal answer. No central authority required. Another example we find that was a human invention is back in 1962, at the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis, we had the United States and we had the Soviet Union with nuclear missiles pointed at each other. And, um, it was believed at the time that, for the United States, a single missile coming over and hitting the Air Force Central Command would destroy the entire communications network for the entire country. So these researchers at this company called RAND Corporation set out to design a next generation network of communications for the Air Force for military use. Um, they considered various design approaches and, and ways to build this correctly from more centralized versions to more decentralized ones. And they preferred the decentralized ones for the same reasons we've talked about already. However, it was believed at the time that decentralized systems were too complex to build with the technology available in the 60s. Nonetheless, in 1969, a prototype was made to actually put four of these nodes together in a decentralized network over the Western United States. 
at various universities, uh, Stanford, Santa Barbara, Utah, and UCLA. And it turned out that this prototype became the foundation of the internet as we know it today. We quite literally have the sum of human knowledge carried around with us wherever we go because of the choice of these researchers in 50 years ago to decide to try to build a decentralized system rather than a centralized system. So, what is this big idea I mentioned at the beginning? Well, the first really comes down to figuring out what the next systems are going to be. And there are two that are incredibly exciting to me that I really want to share with you. These are new systems, maybe five to seven years old in terms of their, their prominence, and uh, I do believe they have as big of impact as the internet and even natural systems that have evolved, like ant colonies, will have. The first has to do with money. Now, money is fascinating for obvious reasons, and many different people have many different opinions about it, but it's hard to argue that today money is completely centralized by nation states that manage it, and they do this through their central banks, the United States using the Federal Reserve and other countries using their own banks. Now, money's interesting because it works based on trust. We use it because we trust it will work when we pay for things, and we, will be, we can be paid in it to actually pay for and buy other things. The medium of exchange is trusted and we agree to actually all use it. But it can be abused, and it has been abused, both by the parts in these centralized systems and by the central authorities trying to balance that oscillation happening. So you can start to see how systems map to real-world events. So knowing what we now know about systems theory, how could we do it better? What if money worked like an ant colony? Or maybe a better example would be, what if money was like the internet, an internet of money? What would it look like? Well, this exists today and was recently invented about five years ago, and it's called cryptocurrency. The most popular version of this is called Bitcoin. And it's interesting for a couple reasons, but one, the most important, I believe, is that you can only create new cryptocurrency in this system by solving increasingly difficult mathematical problems. So it's bound by the laws of mathematics, not by power or wealth. No matter how large or how powerful any entity in this system is, there is an example of a balancing feedback loop that will always try to ensure that the monetary supply and the monetary creation is balanced because of math, not because of influence or political prowess. It also has some other benefits. It's also starting to be trusted by people. Uh, it's agreed to be used. You can buy and sell goods and services with it. But it actually has some benefits that far exceed our traditional financial system. One of these is that in 2013, Bitcoin worth almost $150 million was transferred between two people within minutes for no fees. Now, that would be absolutely impossible to do with the current financial infrastructure today. I mean, with PayPal, it takes three days for me to move money between my one account to my other account as the same person in the United States. So you start to see the friction that we experience today in the financial system. So current cryptocurrency, for the first time, allows for any two parties to exchange value anywhere in the world within minutes for pennies. Just as the internet allowed for the free exchange of information, so too cryptocurrency will do for the exchange of value. The second idea I'd like to touch on quickly is um, this new era of connectivity called the Internet of Things. So we all understand the benefit of a connected world today, first with the internet and then with mobile smartphones. But the next wave of this digital revolution is what's called the Internet of Things. And this is where wireless sensors connect to the physical world all around us. Everything from home appliances to cars to power utilities and farms and oil and gas pipelines and even airplanes and subway systems will all be connected and talking to each other just as we communicate as people through the Internet today. Today, in this Internet of Things world up until this point, there are 20 billion devices connected to 30 billion sensors, but in 2020, in five years, that's going to go from thir to 30 billion devices and over a trillion sensors. The entire Internet of Things size will exceed the entire telecommunications and in Internet infrastructure in total size by 2020. So in other words, it's going to be absolutely massive, bigger than the Internet is today. So, back to this idea. 
What if we took this internet of money and this internet of things and we combined these two decentralized systems to make this Voltron-style large decentralized system? What would it look like? What if smart devices could establish contracts with each other, build reputation, and actually exchange value and transact directly with each other and with people? They could buy and sell their own sensor data. They could actually buy and sell access to the machines that they're connected to. Consider what happens with you when you have this type of environment. Today, the typical power drill purchased by a homeowner is only used a handful of times before it's tossed aside. In fact, it's believed that the motor only runs for a total of 6 to 13 minutes of its entire lifetime. What if you could pay per use for this device instead of paying for it once with a high upfront cost, it then sits in your workbench, and then you throw it away in a few years? Today, we purchase cars, and they sit often in a driveway or a parking lot or a, or a um, street, and we only use them when we need a ride. What if we could pay per ride? Now, not like middlemen with Uber and whatnot, but what if we could pay per ride right to the car manufacturer themselves? IBM and Samsung recently, recently prototyped this type of environment with a washing machine that they had that would purchase its own detergent when its internal sensors noted that it had actually gone low. And it purchased this detergent online through cryptocurrency. Furthermore, when the machine realized that something was broken, again using its sensors, it would actually request service through the internet to the nearest service personnel. And instead of just asking one of them, it would actually send out three or four bids and find the cheapest one to come, come fix it. And it would just notify the user that it actually had done so. So they truly started to explore what it would look like for a device to be smart enough to transact on its own. Why is the combination of these two ideas so powerful to me? Well, what we see here is what I believe is the early revelations of a post-consumerist society, where we pay per use for a product instead of buying it once, throwing it away, and then buying it again, throwing it away, very consumerist. This has global, huge global ramifications for things like poverty levels, cost of living, landfill waste, and the like. It's not really a big stretch, though. Let's think about this. Today, we would buy DVDs and CDs to listen to songs and watch movies. But more and more, we're starting to actually pay small monthly fees for access to libraries of millions of songs and movies available whenever we want. When we pick this apart, what I think we find is that we don't really want to own DVDs and CDs. What we want is the experience that those movies or that music gives us whenever we want to experience it. So building this foundation of this internet of things and this internet of money is what my colleagues and I spend our days and nights obsessing over. And it's funny, just as the folks at the RAND Corporation, when they were inventing the early you know, communications network specifically for the Air Force, they had no idea that what they were actually building was this thing called the internet that would emerge out from it, and then all of the things built on top of the internet, Google and Facebook and WhatsApp and everything else. So, too, we have no idea what we're actually getting ourselves into by putting these two systems together, but we know, based on history, that it will be absolutely phenomenal. In fact, the very first network is exhibiting these properties will be deployed right here in Reno at the end of this year. We're going to be covering the entire valley here, from Peavine to Galena and Mogul to Vista. And I'm delighted to share that with the help from the city administration, the city of Reno will actually be the first testbed in the world to start leveraging this decentralized network to start to tie together their existing city services and make them more decentralized to talk to each other. So the challenge here is really this. Decentralized systems are all around us. Look for them. Sometimes they can be tricky and hide. Just as the natural world and recent human inventions have shown us, these systems are balanced and beneficial, not only for us as humans today, but they very well could change the direction of the human race for good. And we certainly would not want to miss that. Thank you so much. <laughs>